culture essentially freezes because these old ideas don't go away. They don't die out to be replaced by new ones. You're listening to the Futures Podcast with me, Luke Robert Mason. On this show, we meet the scientists, technologists, artists, and philosophers working to imagine the sorts of developments that might dramatically alter what it means to be human. On this video episode, we meet writer and musician Grafton Tanner. Now, as British musical comedian Mitch Ben once sung, everything sounds like cold play now. Indeed, the presence of rampant nostalgia in today's digital media environment means that nothing feels new. With the internet essentially allowing us to participate in a form of on demand, time based tourism. Frighteningly devoid of its own aesthetics, big tech has borrowed feverishly from the cultures of a time before its own existence, and the result is oddly familiar, but also troublingly alien. In his new book, The Circle of the Snake, Grafton Tanner exposes how pop culture propagates and, and tech companies generate these nostalgic feedback loops. And in doing so, he uncovers how they keep us always on and always consuming. So uh, Grafton, what is nostalgia and how does it reveal itself in culture and through the media that we consume? When we think about nostalgia, I think we think of a cultural kind of phenomenon where it's something that uh, we associate with old dated movies, retro movies, retro songs, maybe um, old styles coming back in style, uh, remakes, sequels, prequels, all of that. You know, I think we as- that's what we normally associate with or like the this new TV show out called WandaVision that yeah. um, is like this Marvel Cinematic Universe nostalgic kind of trip. Um but it's important to remember that nostalgia is an emotion. It's like first and foremost something that we, you know, feel, you know, in our bodies, um, and that it can scale up like any other emotion, like anger, for example, to a cultural level. You know that um, content creators and filmmakers and what have you, they can induce any kind of emotion they want in their narratives, whether that's sadness or anger, or it could be nostalgia. Uh, it just so happens that there's a lot of nostalgia in culture today. Um, and there happens to be a lot of nostalgia in human bodies today, um, especially when we, if we want to think about like the, the most recent, you may call it like outbreak of nostalgia coinciding with the outbreak of like COVID-19, where people are yearning for the time before lockdowns and when life seemed to be much more normal than it is now. Um, but it is first and foremost an emotion. Um, whether or not it's a basic human emotion, whether or not it's something that We've always felt all the way back to the very beginning of human time. That's harder to say. Um, But at the same time, it doesn't mean that it's entirely an invention because like most emotions, uh, they change with certain contexts. New emotions get felt in new contexts depending on the time or the culture that you live in. Some cultures recognize certain emotions, others don't. Um, It just so happens that nostalgia doesn't really show up in the literature, in the world, um, until about the late 1600s. Um, And then uh, over time, it goes from being this disease that people thought at the time that needed like some kind of medical cure to being an incurable state of being or in a kind of emotion, for example. Um, And now it's something that everybody sort of knows when they feel it. They could see it in culture. They could see it in politics even um, but there's still no total consensus on exactly what it is. So, so how and, and I guess why did nostalgia become so pervasive in our modern media? There's a number of reasons for this. Uh, and I think we could start with probably the most basic reason, which is that for a few decades now, marketing researchers and consumer scientists have known that nostalgia sells things pretty well, mm. that if you can market a product uh, by inducing nostalgia, like you have a can of Coke and it's got like an old, you know, an an older looking Coke label on it, maybe one from a few decades ago, you're more likely to sell Coke than if you didn't induce it or you maybe if you induce a different emotion. Um, And so that's sort of the first thing is that nostalgia attracts your attention. And so from there, um, if, 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 uh, a marketing company, advertising company, or even just like, you know, big budget filmmaker can get your attention, then of course it's going to drive profits. 
I mean, the problem, though, is that the form of nostalgia that we get is is kind of a warped version of the past. And you even say in the book that the culture industry has much to gain from promoting shades of the past that appeal to intolerant impulses. So how has the past been rewritten? And I guess, to, how has it been weaponized against us? Because it feels like this this nostalgia is a deliberate form of misremembering of the past. It's, it's a way to make the past almost, uh, I guess, more appealing. Yeah, absolutely. And for this, I like to draw on um, I like to draw on the scholar Svetlana Boim, who wrote the future of nostalgia in like early two thousand, like I think maybe like two thousand two thousand one, and you know she she split nostalgia into two different kinds of variations. There was restorative nostalgia and reflective, which is kind of like the the bad kind of nostalgia and the good kind of nostalgia. And so <laughs> it's not necessarily that the emotion is wholly essentially backwards and bad it's just that it you can utilize it in certain ways to support interests that maybe aren't so good uh so the point isn't necessarily to suppress all nostalgic tendencies and and stare into the future because we should never yearn and look at the past we're going to do that anyway i think that's sort of a human condition uh the point instead is uh not to suppress it but to kind of redirect its flows in a way that maybe isn't so bad but over the past few decades, I think what we've seen is a rise of that restorative kind, which Boehm said was the the kind of nostalgia that's more interested in getting back to like some kind of origin point in the past, the kind that's more interested in trying to revive the past no matter what, no matter what that past might look like. It's the kind of nostalgia that's usually grouped together with like uh, the rhetoric of the homeland. Um, these people who are nostalgic in a restorative sense uh, yearn for, um, you know, they they may feel there's been like a grand conspiracy that has separated them from the home and they've got to get back there to it. So it's, it's a very reactionary kind of um, nostalgia. And the reflective kind is less so. It's a little more playful, perhaps even ironic. It's like if I wanted to wear a uh, a t-shirt with an old logo on it. I'm I'm not really being serious about getting back to when the old logo was around. It's more just kind of like a, a playful, ironic thing that I'm doing to say, look how far we've come. This used to be popular and now I'm wearing it. To, you know, it's almost like a joke, maybe. Um, that kind of nostalgia, that's does well like Urban Outfitters, you know, like Urban Outfitters of the early 2010s and, and even still to this day to an extent. But the restorative kind uh, helps to drive politics um, and uh, helps you to, or like, you know, teaches you to buy certain things because restorative nostalgia says there's this thing we got to get back to in the past. And if you endorse me as a candidate or if you buy this product, then we can get back there. I think the best example of where we've seen that express itself in politics is in the phrase, make America great again. I mean, that's probably the the greatest example that we have of a of a desire to turn towards some form of nostalgia. And it's smart because Trump never defined when America was great. He allowed the aesthetics to be uh, placed onto, onto that phrase by its audience. Every person mm. in America has a slightly different idea of when they believe America was great. And really, what a phrase like that tries to do is, I guess, uh, create some sort of uh, a consistent um, ideology of what America is and was and thus could be, but it also it, it really just warps this whole concept of America, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right. That was Trump's weird strength was by <laughs> was not literally pointing to a time when America was last great. It became this kind of subtext. What ended up uh -huh. happening was his supporters filled in the gaps. They they came up with their own idea of when America was last great. And if you take a moment to like go through YouTube and look up um, the genre of music called Trump Wave, which is a <laughs> electronic form of uh, electronic genre of music that takes like clips of Trump speeches and images from Trump on the campaign trail and back when he was president and sort of intercuts them, or I should say pairs them with this kind of retro wave, synth wave, eighties throwback kind of music. 
that's them that's them uh, essentially taking the subtext and making it text because those videos have images of everything from you know 1980s MTV uh, old Simpson Simpsons episodes but also um, images of like you know Hulk Hogan and wrestling from back in the day but they're intercut with these images of people crossing the border and protests as if to say, we got to get back there to the older times, and he, Trump is the one to do that because so much has gone wrong. Uh, I recommend looking them up because they they're kind of frightening, and that's exactly what you know what his his uh, base did was to fill in the gaps. I mean, the reason why we desire sort of a return to to back then, as as you just said it there, is because it feels like at least back then there was kind of a coherent narrative. I guess that's again Trump's power. He was he was creating this this chaos. He was he was reveling in the destruction of narrative, and at the same time promising a return to coherent narrative. Something it feels like we've we've lost through our digital uh, media and environments yeah um and you know to some extent we as sense making humans you know we like to punctuate events to you know past events in order to make sense of them turn them into a kind of a narrative or a story um and so in doing so there's always this kind of tendency with when looking back to see things a lot more structured than maybe they they really were. Um, now, two people can punctuate differently. You know, you have, of course, wide groups of people who looked back into recent history uh, in the West and saw intolerance and all kinds of mass marginalization of groups of people. And then the other people who perhaps are the ones who are supporting Trump punctuate very differently. And they see um, they see a past that is mm-hmm. one where. There wasn't all these like evils that they think like, you know, identity politics or, or things like this. That they're they're really afraid of. And so um, and that's one of the tricky things about nostalgia. And it's it just so happens that it has recently been far more weaponized by the right uh, in ways that might not align with democracy. It felt during that Trump era, we were treating America or at least Trump and, and media was treating America as sort of some form of cinematic universe where they were trying Mm. to um, ad hoc uh, rewrite the entirety of its history to then sell it back to the world in a funny sort of way. As as a Brit, I've always seen America through the lens of 80s movies, I guess. I mean, (laughs) Spielberg is the reason I've always loved America. But again, the Spielberg uh, vision of America is only a very um, mediated, very small version of what it is. Is and, and potentially what it could be. I'm fascinated by the 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 universe building of mm-hmm. like Marvel and Disney and whatnot. There's uh, there's a few reasons why I think that's very popular. I do think that that universe building functions as a kind of like and, and bear with me here. <laughs> I think it functions as a kind of proto virtual reality uh-huh. because it allows us to construct these very finely detailed. Um, worlds in which we can, uh, you know, inhabit in the sense of watching them, but also, uh, you know, they have their own politics and their own backstories. And, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, I, I like, I, I just mentioned WandaVision earlier, I was trying to read like a review of it. And, you know, there are the reviews that talk a lot about how it treats nostalgia and whatnot. But then there are those reviews that that focus that focus more on like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I, I I admit that I've just I'm not I don't know that canon so well, and so I'm reading it like totally confused, you know, like this is a <laughs> this is a different world, but for the people who who can who like that stuff, you know, they're able to almost like live within it to a certain extent, and I think that scale to like the broader society, it has something to do with this not only like gamification or virtualization of, of media and narratives, but also kind of a gamification of, of uh, just like life and politics where it's something that, um, that you can, you know, that that's not rooted in any kind of like real truth. And it is instead something you could sort of build to fit your own story, perhaps your own narrative. And if you get enough people to do that together, then you, I think you end up with something like QAnon Uh, Are these Mm -hmm. conspiracy theories that are not rooted in reality whatsoever, but are instead rooted in a a shared belief that 
reality can be sort of built and controlled in a certain way to inhabit almost as you would like a game. Do you look at how Disney sort of handles Marvel and Star Wars as a property? I mean, the fans come up with fan fiction that which essentially bleeds back into those realities that they they've forced the creators of uh, some of these properties to actually uh, do fan service. I, I think one of the characters in the new Star Wars Mandalorian series, um, the fans wanted a certain actor to portray one of the new Jedi characters, and, mm. and what they managed to do there was was create enough sort of uh, um, libidinal energy in this reality to affect another reality. It, it, it is kind of a weird. I mean, I'm. Uh, quite shamelessly, I'm a, I'm a bit of a Star Wars fan, and it goes back to the fact that that's where my childhood lived. You yeah. know, in, in 1999, Star Wars Episode One came out, and to me, as a you know a 10, 11 year old kid, I mean, that was so new and so exciting to me. And, and when I see things like the Mandalorian reappear on our screens, I'm, I'm hark back to that time as a child. I, I've openly tweeted, oh God, I feel like a 12 year old again. Every time I watch Luke Skywalker appear with a lightsaber inside the Star mm -hmm. Wars universe, you know, I just don't know what this media is doing to me, but I know I feel that feeling. You kind of get very hopeless. You kind of relinquish yourself to these uh, to these realities. You want to live inside of them for a little while. And I wonder if that's just escapism or if there's something else going on there. I think well, escapism is, is a part of it, absolutely. And uh, and people want an escape, you know. Um, mm. I mean, that that's sort of the part of the plot of the film ready player one which is that you've got this future world that's totally collapsed and the only like way that people can get by is by escaping into the into the oasis game and and just messing around with the, with the with like the safe pop cultural markers of the previous decades and so there's definitely an element of escapism there and 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 look so there's nothing necessarily wrong about escaping because people i think need that escape absolutely mm -hmm. um and i um but there's always like we don't want to lose you forever we want you to come back you don't have to go away forever and escape we the the point is to return you know and and maybe tell us what you've learned in your escape i do think so um i just finished up a manuscript for and a whole book on the politics of nostalgia just like tight focused about nostalgia in the 21st century. It'll be out later this year. I have a chapter on escape. I also have a section about um, what I call the nostalgia industry, which is kind of like the culture industry, but one that's more like Disney, Marvel, Lucasfilm, that's interested in churning out these nostalgic uh, stories. One of the reasons why Disney is as Henry Giroux calls it, the nostalgia machine like par excellence is because Disney has consistently for years and years lobbied to keep all of their works out of the public domain so that they can like keep the copyright on everything from Mickey Mouse forward. Um, in doing so, they uh, they continually create, you know, after buying Star Wars, or after buying Lucasfilm and having those rights to make Star Wars films, more Star Wars movies, more Marvel movies and all of this, uh, because they know it's going to sell and because they know that stuff's never going to lead. It's never going to like go out of copyright. Mm -hmm. It's always going to be like something they can use um, to sell and build their, you know, their universes more and make more money, build their franchises even more. Um, but, you know, the, the effect of this is that Culture essentially freezes because these old ideas don't go away. They don't die out to be replaced by new ones. And they're not ever going to as long as Disney continues to lobby for copyright extensions. And the reason why they're able to do that is because they're Disney and they're yeah. huge, you know. So this sort of process of not just consolidation where these mega corporations buy each other up. Um, but also the, the, the process of extending that copyright means that there just isn't a lot of new and diverse voices, uh, and ideas. Instead, they're kind of all being edged out by the same things, Star Wars, Marvel, you know, and Disney. You know, I, I struggle with the the Marvel universe because you want to look at these sorts of highly popular media and see how they comment on 
current society. And the Marvel Cinematic Universe, as, as you said, with WandaVision, is starting to play with the idea of alternative realities, quantum time, the possibility of time travel. And and when I first saw that, I thought, wow, they're understanding how we're moving towards an uh, understanding of reality in the quantum sense. And they're representing that on the screen and making us feel more comfortable about the possibility of there being a multitude of, of possibilities and a multitude of worlds in which we could live. And then the more I thought about it, I, I realized, well, in actual fact, it might not be a comment on the latest uh, understanding of physics. What it might actually be is just a idealized um, example of perfect corporate synergy. If you can mm. create multiple worlds, then you can create multiple strands of the same story. And even Marvel now is doing something called What If, where they basically take all the stories they've already told and then slightly change things about them so they can retell them again. So it, it's nothing to do with uh, an understanding of how we're we're moving from a, from a, a lineal understanding of time to a quantum understanding of time. It's everything to do with corporate synergy. And that's the sad thing about it i have not heard of this that they, they'll what if they'll change like certain things of the stories and repackage them so they're basically uh using the source material and then changing small bits about it to to basically milk more ip from the original symbol of the superhero character that they have mm. access to. But yeah, and I agree, Wonder Vision is is I guess a kind of oddly self-referential version of that because uh, and I, I assume you've you've seen the first couple of episodes. I mean, the first couple of episodes are nonsensical. They're set in a 60s TV show. You're sitting there expecting superheroes and it's not until about, you know, no spoiler alerts here, but it's not until about the third or fourth episode do they finally kind of create the bleed between the outside world and this this fictional TV world that's being created, we don't know yet, but being created by um, what well, seems to be the main characters. So they're mm -hmm. just seems to be this odd playfulness that's happening that we are passive observers to. I, 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 I'm reading your book. It made me more critical about how Disney um, operates with their, with their IP. And that, that playfulness, you know, it attracts attention. It allows them to, I mean, they, they could, they could play with their, their, uh, published works as much as they want because, like I said, you know they've they've got they've got firm copyright hold on them, you know. Um, and so, yeah, at first glance, it's it's like wow, you know, how self referential and meta, and that's kind of cool and far more interesting than just sort of blatant spoon fed free base nostalgia or something. Um, but uh, yeah, it's all in service of essential in service to their their profits, you know, mm -hmm. essentially them trying to. Um, you know, get you to watch it by any means necessary. And I think this is, so this is part of the reason why um, Easter egg marketing is so effective is that um, people tend to, you know, like I said, be attracted to the things that they're able to recognize. And so they're, and that also becomes sort of a process of, of, of gamifying uh, culture and media is uh, the act of watching then becomes not necessarily something about keeping up with the plot line or understanding deeper themes or character motivation or whatever it is that we do when we uh, consume narratives and stories, but instead is more about like trying to hunt the references in order to tally them and see how many you can, can. So it's very, it's like a citational almost like practice of, of consuming. Um, but, but ultimately it serves them really well. It serves a company like Disney really well because, um, you know, they know it's going to do well. Mm. And I wonder whether that citational way of watching large popular media has bled back into real life. I mean, it, it really does feel like the QAnon thing, doesn't it? I mean, you, you look for any clue within reality to be able to generate the narrative that, that points back at the assumption that you had. You know, the spoilers are in the the little cues, the, the referential cues that you can notice in reality. And that's how these weird conspiracy theories almost begin. Yeah, I was just talking to, um, to somebody the other day and uh, talking about like, uh, I don't know, maybe like Trumpism as a kind of ideology that operates that very same way. Some like an ideology that went viral or something and, and that people, um, you know, believe because it is kind of like 
a game. Uh, so conspiracies are like that. But even just, I mean, just l existing in the world. And if you happen to, you know, leave your house, I mean, now it's, you know, we're in the pandemic or whatnot, but like being able to go down the road and, and see, you know, signage billboards brick and mortar stores i mean nostalgia is not even just in the narratives we consume on netflix or something or disney plus but it's 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 literally everywhere and so even in the even in the real world there's always this um spotting the reference that we tend to be doing spotting the references that we tend to do um even just existing in the world and so it, it's really hard to escape the that kind of Easter egging of just, you know, reality, even beyond the media that we consume. I mean, the key to your your book really is is about nostalgia's relationship with big tech and media corporations. So, I mean, how do the big tech companies, how do they keep us locked inside of this nostalgia trap using algorithmic analysis and, and all sorts of never ending feedback loops? There's a few ways that I see a nostalgia kind of being generated out of our relationship to big tech and the devices that we use. I mean, you know, uh, being a social media user and having being tethered to certain devices like iPhones or whatnot, you know, it kind of keeps you always on. You're always doing this sort of immaterial labor of branding and networking and whatnot. And that that is kind of a breeding ground for nostalgia because there's always this yearning to like throw the phone down and get off. So we were just talking, you know, about trying to get off social media and leave all that behind um, because you're kind of always working and hustling and there's no sort of rootingness to it as you're, you're constantly, you know, having to having to essentially sell yourself and that can mm. be very stressful on a person and therefore nostalgia tends to come with that. Um, there's also the fact that the internet is itself a giant archive and that you could pretty much look up anything from your past that you want to. It could be, um, you know, things from your childhood. Like I follow this, I did this sort of experiment on myself where I followed this um, account on Instagram that just posts like once a day, these images of old Lego sets from like the eighties and nineties. And I mean, it is literally a hit of nostalgia every time I go on there and see, I'm not even like looking for it. I just check my Instagram and there it is. Um, and so being able to to look up anything and find anything from your past old tv shows old random commercials that only aired a few times but you saw them enough a few decades ago to remember them and so watching them again you feel nostalgic for that time that's kind of like how the internet sort of works but in terms of the the algorithms that we have to that we sort of interact with uh, all the time when we're online there's been a lot of great work on algorithmic bias. Uh, Sophia Noble is one of them. She wrote um, Algorithms of Oppression, in which she writes about, you know, the the biases of these um, people who create the algorithms and the computer scientists and coders or whatnot uh, in, end up sort of encoding their biases and things like Google search, for example. Um, but then you have uh, people like Catherine Stinson, who um, is a researcher looking at what happens with with culture when when how we come across new cultural ideas is by essentially an algorithm recommending it to us, what happens then? And she writes about how that leads to sort of a general homogenization of ideas um, because the algorithm is only going to recommend what it thinks you like and what it thinks you like is what you've previously looked up or consumed before. And so what it recommends is itself sort of a derivative of that. Um, so algorithmic feedback loops work by recommending things to you that you already know that you like, or maybe you already tell them, you know, the algorithm that you like. And it just so happens that if that happens to be like a piece of nostalgia, like if you happen to want to watch say by the bell or something, cause you're super nostalgic or whatnot, then of course the algorithm is just going to see that and just keep giving you nostalgia over and over again, even if you didn't want it. I mean, all of this graft and all of this feels like it, it, started at a particular time. And you, you point towards perhaps two moments that, that began our nostalgic turn. And that's the shit sandwich that is 9-11 in 2001 and the recession in 2008. So what is it about those moments uh, in history and culture that, that made nostalgia so appealing to us? I like to, I like to start at 9-11 because it's 
it's a time it's I mean, like, again, it ushered in sort of the 21st century, but it also ushered in a particular kind of like nationalistic um, nostalgia in response to what Robert J. Lifton has called futurelessness, which is this mass belief among people that that anything is possible now that we know that people can fly planes into buildings. And so he, he writes that in the aftermath of 9-11, there's this feeling of like deep despair, but not just like, not just any kind of despair, but a, a despair that the future could only be more horrible now that we know this because we can never truly be safe. Um, and it's also expounded by the, the you know, then going to war. And now, now not only are you worried about random acts of terrorism, but now we're at war and will the war come home to the homeland and all of this. And so that sort of futurelessness that he writes about, uh, I argue that nostalgia tends to be a, a, like almost a way to ward that off, you know, by, by settling instead and rooting oneself into these, uh, familiar, perhaps even patriotic ideas of the past and the homeland and, and then therefore feeling more safe. After 2008, uh, you know, my generation, for example, like going out of college or whatnot and not having work and no jobs and feeling pretty much like knocked out at the knees, moving back in with their parents, something that's happening right now, again, in the pandemic, um, but also starting to consume uh, nostalgic content around this time using some of these, you know, algorithmic, uh, you know, recommender things that are starting to come more mainstream around that time. And so, yeah, I mean, if you're out of a job because of a recession and you move back in with your parents and you start binging a bunch of nostalgic media, something that people have been doing at least for the past year, especially, but also, uh, you know, right after the recession for years after 2008, um, then yeah, what you're going to be recommended is more of that nostalgic content, thus trapping you almost in this kind of nostalgic consumption loop. Yeah, uh, when you mentioned 2001, 2008 being so prevalent, I, I did have to think, what do I remember from that moment? So I was in my teens, you were you were in your teens as well. We were 11, 11 or 12 years old to about 18 years old. I just, I just don't, I can't confidently point at anything that denotes that era. It feels like there's a physical gap in my memory. I just, I, it, it's, it's weird to me that I can't point at a, a single cultural moment between those times. And maybe it's, it's just a factor of my age and, and that I was in my teens and that, you know, that, that wasn't uh, something I was particularly looking for. Or perhaps we just did have this, this beginning of the end of cultural creation, a slip into away from the new and into, into this nostalgic period. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel kind of similarly. I mean, I think my memory of it is that, uh, is that there was a lot of fear and anxiety and it was like the beginning mm. of like a mass constant ambient kind of anxiety that has only seemed to just increase with each new crisis. Um, but there's also, there was also a lot of, um, push to get people to not only go fight these wars in the aftermath of 9-11, the war on terror, but also for everybody to sort of come together and support it, to, to unify the audience of the United States, especially, but the West, um, to support this cause. And uh, in, in, in the book that I have coming out later this year about nostalgia, um, I write about the creation of the Department of Homeland Security as a way to sort of codify nostalgia in, you know, almost like in society uh, to say that, you know, to secure the homeland is itself a nostalgic kind of um, impulse because when people feel that feeling, what they yearn for is the safety of home. And it's different because home isn't necessarily a place we can go to now. That would cure homesickness. But nostalgia is a home that kind of, you know, ex exists somewhere in the in the past that we really can't get back to. And hence there's that feeling. Um, and to, to refer to the United States as the homeland, which is something that had been done before, but to literally make a department out of it. Now, suddenly there's this feeling where this place is sacred and it's our origin point. And if we aren't careful, it's going to be under attack. Thus, we're, you know, we lose it all, you know, and so there's this sort of constant nostalgia for the homeland that is already 
always at risk of being lost. Um, and I think that's something that is in my mind, one of the, one of the major long lasting effects of nine 11 is this, is this, uh, terror of losing the origin point, which is the United States. And, this is now being written about a little bit more widely, especially in the wake of um, all the protests that happened under Trump in 2020. People were writing about how the war came home. It was like the war finally is at, in the United States um, after so many years of it being over there. Now it's here and we're like almost at war with each other. Yeah, it's this like this um, feeling that the you know that we have to hold on to this thing called the homeland and that if you aren't nostalgic for it, then the DHS is going to send its boots after you and like and force you to be nostalgic for it. I, I think I really misunderestimated the long term psychological impact of nine eleven on our generation, and it, it didn't become real to me because, of course, I'm British, and the way I saw it was eleven years old on a TV, on a on a square TV at that, and it didn't hit home to me till I was I was in New York, and I got into an Uber cab um, at JFK, and I get in the back of the Uber cab, and the Uber driver goes, uh, "Man, where are you flown from?" I go, "Well, I came from London." He goes, "How long is that, dude?" I go, "It's about an eight hour flight." He goes, "Man, I can't fly." I go, "What do you mean?" He goes. I can't fly, man. I'm probably your age. I'm about, you know, 30 odd years old. I can't fly. I go, why? He goes, I saw those planes go into those buildings on TV. And ever since then, man, I've been scared of flying. I won't step on a plane. And it was at that moment, it kind of became obvious to me that that has had such a, a, a scar on um, our generation, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I haven't flown in a while because of the pandemic, but I think about it every time, you know, uh, I, I get in a plane and um, and, and you know, there are plenty of crises that predate 9-11 that help to unleash nostalgia. It does seem like for longer than even just the past 20 years for well through the last century, even each new major kind of event just sort of unleash nostalgia on, on a wider scale, or at least, you know, once it starts to die down, suddenly the next major crisis happens and then it, it spreads it once again. And so we're living through that now, you know, I mean, the, I feel like the, the, the major crisis events are getting like, they're starting to come one after the other a little more quickly. Um, and, you know, I, I regard Trump's four years in office as a, as one of these events um, to, one of the kinds of nostalgia, not just the one that the the kind that he induced, but also the nostalgia for like the Obama era. You have a number of people on the left who uh, voted for Joe Biden because they felt like he could bring us back to that origin point, back to that that safe point. When, in fact, of course, we know the time before Trump wasn't, you know, wasn't very safe at all. It wasn't like some utopia by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and now we're we're in yet another perhaps um more powerful, maybe even one to rival um, the nostalgia outbreak of 9-11, which is the COVID-19 pandemic, where um, just, you know, a week into the, uh, at least in the U.S., a week into the lockdowns, and the number of these articles were being written about uh, people binging nostalgic media to try to get through it. And and so I think we're, we're living through a major uh, moment where that emotion is is very high. I wonder if it wasn't for the internet and if it wasn't for this nostalgic media, if we would ever make it through the COVID-19 crisis. We, we've been going through this for almost a year now. We've been in and out in lockdown in the UK for pretty much a year. Um, February uh, 2020 sort of marks the beginning of when we were slipping into lockdown and it's February 2021 now, but that time's passed so quickly. And I wonder if there is a weird effect that nostalgia and the web and how uh, uh, media is presented in this format messes with memory. I think it definitely does. It definitely messes with your sense of temporality of knowing, uh, of being able to experience time. You know, I, um, I, I think of the 2010s as sort of the moment when, I mean, I think even Doug Rushkoff said this, that they were kind of post-temporal, like there was no, it didn't feel like the time passed nor as it normally would in the 2010s. And there were also um, writers who 
were coming out with articles at the end of the 2010s saying the exact same thing, like the 20 felt like they didn't happen or whatnot. And I think some of this has to do with the way that we consume content and media and, and by extension, the way that we uh, consume events and then, and then understand them as well. Um, and so I, the sense of time passing over the past year, especially in 2020 during the pandemic, uh, that sense of time passing is very different for different people. And I think in one way, it could feel like it has gone on forever. And then in another way, like you say, it it doesn't seem like it's been a year at all. I mean, I think about over the summer uh, feeling like that didn't exist in 2020. Like, I don't know what it was, but my summer experience seemed to be a different year and that I went from lockdown in March and April to like September, you know, I'm not really sure what that, what that means, but I think that, that consuming nostalgic things at the very least can help you get through, uh, really bad times how that changes your sense of time, I think, depends on uh, how much of maybe the the media that you do consume, because, it you know, I think for so many people over the past year, there just doesn't seem to be a, a regular beginning, middle and end. And some of this also has to do with the fact that there isn't really an end yet to the pandemic. Mm. I mean, it's not just about how media is consumed, but it's how it's represented, how it's captured and represented. And as I was reading your book and as I'm listening to you now, I, I can't help but remember uh, Douglas Copeland, um, the author, the, the science fiction author, who in 2012 had a presentation at the Serpentine Gallery, where he jokingly talked about this idea of nine tenor cillin, nine tenor cillin a magical pill, a magical drug that you can take that makes you think 9-11 never happened. (laughs) And the reason he kind of uh, proffered this idea was if you actually look at the footage from that day, everyone's hair and everyone's clothing looks oddly familiar. You know, it's been almost 20 years, but the aesthetics, the fashion hasn't really changed much. And the only thing that seems odd, apart from the fact that all the footage from that moment is in four by three, is that nobody's standing on the street pointing their phone at Mm. the sky as it's happening. And he argues, look, that that means two things. Either either 9-11 was the last top-down mediated event in global history. It's the last global event where you and I and everybody across the globe would have seen, I think it was like six or seven camera angles of those planes hitting the buildings. I mean, that's all we have, you know, mm. and that becomes burned into our, our retina. And what we could actually end up seeing 9-11 as is, is possibly the last under-documented event in history because there wasn't mm. people there who were able to point their, point their um, phones at the sky. I, j- I just wonder how, how all of that changes our memories of these events. The, the fact that, you know, look, we, we, we are not the people who are mediating these events at, at that point in time, but we are now. That's interesting because cause even... At the when it happened, it was considered a major media spectacle, and of course now we know that, as you say, it's really compared to the uh, the dizzying amount of of information we can record at any given time. All of us who have access to phones and whatnot, that's it does seem very under mediated by comparison. Um, I do think that over mediation leads to a kind of amnesia that there doesn't seem to be um it leads to a, a not a, not a very well established coherent understanding of something i think that's one of the reasons why it feels like the 2010s didn't really happen is because there was uh such a gathering you know uh info glut is what mark andreevich calls it but but just it almost kind of like kept gathering and gathering where each of us is you know kind of recording our own ideas and our own realities and there's just so much information no one could ever collate it into some kind of meaningful you know beginning middle and end i think there has to be uh a, a maybe maybe a slight bit of under mediation in order to make sense of certain things but, but um, grafton do you think america is even capable of doing under mediation 
You know, the, the, the thing about 9-11 that really struck me was in 2012, which was the first time I ever visited New York, I went to go see, um, then at the time, the, the 9-11 Memorial. And in 2012, the thing was still being built. The Freedom Tower hadn't been built yet. And I had to go through this kind of faux um, airport style security to even be let on the grounds to go and see the, to go and see the, the fountains, the infinity fountains that they have there. And you arrive and the infinity, the infinity fountains are built verbatim on the grounds of the buildings. These two massive squares that represent exactly where the towers were. And as you get closer to these memorials, they have around the outside, they have the names written and you see all the names of the people who had, um, had died. But the thing that was most striking to me was the sound. As you get closer mm. to these infinity, um, in these infinity fountains, what you hear is, which oddly enough is also the sound of buildings in free fall. So it's like they've mediated the actual collapse, the actual tragedy itself, and then have fixed it and are constantly representing that. And I didn't realize what sort of psychological impact that might have until I went to the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin a couple of years later. And the Holocaust Memorial is an entirely different visceral experience. You you go there and it's these um, concrete pillars that are, are built amongst this very kind of uncomfortable um, uh, 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 stonework. So it's these, these cobbles that you have to walk through. And eventually as you walk through, through the memorial, these uh, pillars sort of engulf you. They get larger and larger because the ground is dipping. And there's no names. There's no names of the folks who who died, the Jews who died in that in the in the Holocaust. And you have this weird, uncomfortable, visceral response. You feel like something terrible has happened or something terrible is happening and you hear the echoes of other people in that space. It's not specifically trying to remediate uh, what happened in the Holocaust. Obviously, that would be horrible to do. But then when you compare that to the 9-11 memorial and you're hearing the infinity fountains, you're like, why are they just focusing purely verbatim on the collapse? It, it, it feels like you're trying to force the the eye and the ear back to that moment, back to that moment, back to that moment constantly. And I just mm. wonder if that's just an American way of, uh, of mediating memory. It's not possible to do what they've done in Europe with the, with the Holocaust Memorial, just create a visceral feeling of, of something. Of course, you know, the Holocaust is not in most people's recent memories. So there has to be a different way of remembering. Yeah. I, I had not thought about that. I think that's, that's, I think that's interesting. I mean, I, I think about, you know, if, if we talk about 9-11 as a kind of spectacle, then the mm -hmm. memorial being itself, it's a kind of spectacle, you know, makes sense. And I think there's something to do with this. You talk about the, the nine tennis or whatever, you know, that's something to do with the way that we remember 9-11 having something to do that we were the way we remember 9-10, you know, September 10th, everything before, um, even the ones who didn't who weren't even alive then there's always this, you know, with, with, with these, you know, commemorations and whatnot of nine 11, there's this idea of like, everything was calm and placid and September 10th, everything was good. And then September 11th, it was like the world ended. Um, in, in 2011, I think it was ABC news. They ran this thing called the way we were in which they highlighted the major news stories of September 10th before the world changed forever, I, I think is what they say. Um, and there's, I think that's got something to do with that kind of memorial of, uh, you know, something that's so spectacularly devastating and deadly that just occurs in an instant and that just right before it's a different world, just the day before, a few hours before on September 10th, it's like a foreign country. Um, I, I want to say maybe there's, maybe, maybe there's something there with that. Do, do you think we have a... And I have to be careful here, but do you think we have a weird desire for something that monumentous to happen again, to sort of shock us out of the current malaise that we're in? Is is there an odd thirst for a media moment like that, that we can all share collectively? Because it feels like we no longer have any of these forms of, of 
grand um, narrative. I'm not saying that, you know, I, I, by any means that um, I want another terrorist incident to occur, but I mean, what is it on a global scale that could occur that would sort of shock us into um, dealing finally with the new? Um, it just feels like we're, we're dealing with this this trauma and we're dealing with it by avoiding it, by, by going to the time uh, before it even happened to escape the memory of it even happening. Well, I think that there's some some like post 9-11 cinema scholars who have talked about some of the disaster films and whatnot that came out in the wake of 9-11 as being sort of like a, a you know, a, a replaying of the of the grand, spectacular, explosive moment, traumatic moment or whatever. I think about like films like The Day After Tomorrow, which I, I believe was. Yeah, that was post nine eleven, and and the Transformers films and and whatnot, and and you know these massive um, visual feasts of destruction that that were really popular in the two thousands, um, and uh, I think that serves as a kind of way to to deal with and deal through some of to feel through, if you will, some of the um, some of that initial shock of, of 9-11 to replay it over and over again as if to feel it once again for the first time, the sheer horror. You know, I, I know that, you know, shortly into the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, you know, there with like me and my friends, you know, we're we're texting one another and calling and it does seem to be like a galvanizing moment. Suddenly, mm. you know, maybe not um, the same kind of galvanizing moment you have after 9-11, which was one that was very much about re-knitting a community under like the signs of patriotism, for example, and then therefore justifying, you know, going to war. This was sort of like a collective, we're all in this together kind of feeling. And that eventually went away, you know, uh, and, and it went away for a number of reasons. One of those is, you know, the, the wake of the, of, you know, George Floyd's, you know, public execution essentially that led to the protests of people who um, were already like one stuck at home, two many of them without jobs and whatnot, and feeling the weight of the of the pandemic a few months in, and then something horrific like that happens, and 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 they hit the streets, rightfully so. Um, but you know, it just it feels like that that it's you know, I th- I think it, it's not going to take a giant spectacular event horrific event to galvanize a lot of people in a way to then deal with 9-11. Instead, each event sort of just kind of plays off the one before it. The trauma only increases because it's kind of just so hard, at least in the United States, it's it's relatively difficult to live as just a regular working person. It's like, how many of my friends lost health care when they lost their jobs in the, in the wake of the pandemic? How many of us are kind of burdened and to some extent by, by student debt, which can be literally just eliminated tomorrow if our president wanted to do it? All of these things that just make it so difficult so that when major national crises happen, you barely can survive. Well, the, 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 then that becomes a thing that there's nothing to be nostalgic for. If we're jumping from terrible moment to terrible moment, there's not going to be a generation that looks back and COVID-19 and goes, oh, those were the good old days, you know? Well, it depends because that's how, that's the funny thing about nostalgia is that a lot of times the good old, you know, I, who was, I think it was Phoebe Bridgers tweeted <laughs> like, these better not be the good old days. And I, I replied, I was like, but I think they're probably going to be because that's just, wow. That ends up, you know, how, how usually how it happens. I mean, I, I was talking to someone else, um, the other day about, you know, kind of being slightly nostalgic for the early days, at least in the U S of lockdown when they didn't really have to do anything. Um, and, and the reason why they feel that is because, and I can, I, I totally can see this, um, in the United States being forced back to work when maybe you don't want to because the pandemic is still so bad and the numbers are still so high. Um, yeah, of course you would yearn for when you could just stay at home if you were privileged enough to do that um, and and not have to risk your life going out and trying to work you know, while this thing's so bad. But yeah, uh, you know, nostalgia tends to misremember all parts of the past. It remains to be seen whether or not some of these recent things like the COVID-19 pandemic will... Uh, be looked back at fondly. I, I'm just not sure. The the interesting thing to me is 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 not not just how nostalgia allows us to canonize say media or canonize reality, but it's it's how it's 
forcing us in the present to canonize ourselves. So let me let me explain that a little more. We're essentially using social media to create a canon version of our own identity to then represent that to the world and to fix everything and fix by which I mean hold in place everything mm. that we are in the present. And I guess the when you talk about nostalgia, the first social media platform most folks think of is Instagram because Instagram originally was set up to create those little filters over those very low resolution images so they would look uh, very referential. They would look like little Polaroid uh, square photographs and it was this kind of very cute appeal to nostalgia. But what Instagram has morphed into with folks with you know this whole new age of instagram influences is something whereby it's no longer about nostalgia but it's about creating fictional layers on top of nostalgia, creating whole new realities. Instagram influencers sit and they edit their photos ad infinitum and draw out certain colors, do these odd high dynamic range filters. They they put fake stars into the uh, into the sky. They put fake birds and fake clouds, fake lights. You know, they're, they're creating this utterly false rendering of the world. And all that ends up doing as, as someone who then has to um, sort of perceive that media is it just provokes a deep sadness. It provokes a deep sadness that we can't live there in the reality that they've created. So I guess my question is, you know, how do platforms like Instagram lead to this very warped understanding of, of who we are and how we should canonize our lives? Well, it's got a lot to do. I mean, you, you said fix and and really both, both meanings of the word, like not just yep. solidify in a place, but also to, to, to correct, you know, for the future you to look back on. I mean, like, you know, not just Photoshop, but just the using the the very basic uh, editing software you can get on your phone before you upload, you know, a photo. Um, and so and and more than just editing, curating and selecting what you choose to put, you know, online and therefore it become a part of your your feed or whatnot you know, you've got all these layers of kind of like, you know, unreality that between the thing that you experienced and then what ends up showing up on Instagram when you go back to it. Um, and, and th this, it's kind of like the, the, the main problem with photography in general, which is that it allows you to fix moments and look back at them and perhaps, um, you know, feel that nostalgic rush a lot easier than if you just had to sit back and close your eyes and really try really hard to think about it. Now you just look and it's there, right? Um, but being able to constantly document your life and curate it to make it look as good as you possibly can or as unreal and utopian as possible uh, means that, yeah, that that later on you're likely to look back and see that, you know, fake world, if you will, on Instagram and, and yearn for it. And even like, I mean, being able to have that much information about yourself, that the, that many images of yourself in the future, you will look back. You'll see how you used to look and what you used to do. I mean, look back on your feeds and look back before before February 2020 and look at what the way life used to you know look. And and I guarantee you, you'll feel um, a little bit of of nostalgia. And that that um, that's something that's relatively new. Katie Icorn uh, wrote this book called um, The End of Forgetting, in which she talks about growing up with social media and like being a young person and sort of becoming aware that your parents have since the day you were conceived put stuff about you online, including images of you when you were a kid and a baby and whatnot and how that sort of uh, causes the childhood to like always be there and follow you into the future when maybe it's something you need to like leave behind. Um, and I don't, I don't, I'm trying to remember, I don't think she explicitly, well, she talks a little bit about nostalgia, but yeah, I mean, being able to look back at what, uh, what maybe by the time you're 18 years old in this day and age is your entire life documented on something like Instagram does make it relatively difficult, I think. And, and I think she would agree to sort of move into the future and leave some of that stuff behind and let that stuff be forgotten. That being said, 
that stuff can be forgotten. I mean, you know, you, all you got to do is deactivate the account and that stuff is gone. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's not, not like it, totally. It, it's know. not even documentation, though, is it? It's, it's remediation because, I mean, the way I can look back on my childhood is I go to the uh, the loft or the cupboard under the stairs in my parents' house, and there's a, a biscuit tin of printed photos that allow me to sort of see myself as a child. But uh, the moment at which you look at that photo suddenly your memory changes. I remember less about my childhood by looking at those images and remember more about the moments that were captured by looking about uh, looking at those images. So we've got to be really careful with what we capture and what we fix and then fixate on because mm. I do think it can have a real impact on sort of how we tell the narrative of our lives back to ourselves. And then the same sort of interest that, that you have about what happens to these kids who are born digital, whose parents had mediated their lives up until they're 18 and then in some sort of weird moment of digital bar mitzvah hand over the passwords to their accounts. I mean, surely the thing you'd want to do at that moment as any 18 year old is just to delete everything, mm -hmm. you know, get rid of everything, start again, be able to play your identity, you know, be your own person and not be fixed by the images of yourself that have been put on these platforms. And of course, as you write so beautifully in the book, what these platforms end up doing with images like that are analyzing them for cues that then can be used to sort of sell things back to us. So, <clears throat> you know, there's um, hundreds of photos of, of, of this kid sucking his thumb, though, then we know that he's orally instead of anally retentive. So that's going to change the way in which advertisers then market to him. So there's almost a, there's almost a, a, a good reason to not put children into these platforms, not to mess with their memories by, by fixing them and then allowing them to fixate on how the parents have subjectively edited their identity. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very it's a strange problem and it's a it's a novel one. We're just now starting to I think that's why her book is so great is that yeah. you know, she's sort of one of the first to to really think about this problem and what it might mean for people who are coming of age and wanting to perhaps leave some parts of themselves behind that they should leave behind. And like I said, I mean that is a problem, but there's also the problem of being able to get rid of that stuff pretty quickly. I mean, nothing ever really dies on the internet, you know, yeah. but if you wanted to get rid of, you know, all of that, you could just deactivate it and it's gone. And and that itself is almost kind of a, an issue. Svetlana Boyne was writing this in the early 2000s. She said, you know, on the, I'm going to paraphrase it, but like, you know, on the internet, you've got these two options, either total memory recall by having all that stuff archived for you to see or total disappearance mm -hmm. and it's gone. And it's very tenuous. It's not like the, uh, you know, under the stairs with the with the photographs where, I mean, yeah, I guess I could throw those into the fire or whatever, but I cannot get rid of them or call them up as easily and quickly as I can get my phone out and scroll really fast and within seconds be in the past or press a button and it's gone. It, it, it's going to be difficult to navigate the relationship we have with information that we place in the cloud. Again, Douglas Copeland talks about this beautifully, and, and it, it's so prevalent for our moment right now. He talks about how if you want time to pass quickly, then just go on the internet. And it feels <laughs> like in a COVID-19 environment where all that I do is spend time on a machine interacting and there is no differentiation to my day with the exception of being able to do these these podcast interviews uh, this moment has passed so quickly and, and all of my memories are generated by my interactions with a shiny glowing rectangle sitting in front of me and i guess you know that's that's a problem at this stage but it could get worse if we start to escape completely into virtual realities of our own creation and I think that's one of the that's one of the important things about escape is that it's important to escape every so often to kind of like reorient yourself and to to kind of get a different perspective. And but there has to be like a return process because, I, I you know, mere escapism like um, I think could be really dangerous um, and and wrenches people out of the world and in, in ways that it, it might be really unproductive when they really need to just kind of get away for a little bit and then be able to come back and and 
and give what they've learned perhaps back to the present. This is one of my, I, I write about this in, in the book that's coming out later this year. Um, one of the, one of my problems with, with people who are always trying to like go off the grid, people who are trying to escape to, you know, cabin in the woods kind of thing, um, is that it's a solution only for those people. There's no, like there, there's, it doesn't help society or the collective whatsoever um, just by by exiting society and being like, I'm out of here. That's a solution only for you. Uh, um, the the guy, Mark Boyle, who I think that's his name, who goes by like the term the moneyless man who started to live without money like at the turn of the 2010s and then ended up moving out to a cabin in the woods just without any technology whatsoever. He's written some books, of course, about this experience, but he did this interview like a few years back where he essentially admits like, like, yeah, I don't know anything about Brexit. You know, I don't really understand. I don't really know. Any- I- I'm able to. Thankfully, I don't have to worry about that. And it's like, well, good for you. Good yeah. for you. That's one of the problems I have with escapism is that um, the the pure total escape. I'm off the grid. See ya. That uh, that doesn't that doesn't help anything. Nobody but you, basically. But it doesn't have to be that pure, does it? I mean, there, there could just be an advantage of managing our relationship with digital technology, having, you know, a dopamine break from these devices. And that doesn't necessarily need to be a, a privileged position. It's difficult when your job is so intimately tied to the use of shiny glowing rectangles. But if it's not, then then why can't we begin to retreat away from the use of of this social media is it is the dopamine kick just way too strong right now recently in the past few years you've had a number of ex silicon valley um technocrat guys come out and argue for people to just put down the phones this is what the social dilemma was about it's those those guys the documentary the social dilemma yeah, those just put, guys <laughs> those guys yeah yeah i got in a fight with them on twitter a few months back i feel really embarrassed about it but um <laughs> Yeah, they they like put down the phone, you know, like take a digital detox, put down the phone, whatever. And I, you know, I, I teach I teach uh, college, and I often tell my students like take six months off of social media, you know, just to to see what it's like, you know, and to also maybe give yourself a break. But then you know, just just to, just experience what that might feel like. It's kind of when I got off Facebook, it was very. It was a it was a strange experience and and kind of a kind of a cool experience to be honest felt way mm. more rooted in a way, but you know at the same time, just this blanket statement uh, this blanket statement to say just put down your phones is uh, is a problem for a few reasons. One is that as you say, not everybody can put down the phones. You got people who you know rely on phones for their jobs mm-hmm. you know they got to work you know i hate that that's the way it is but you can't just put it down students for example constantly plugged into their phone not just because they want to post on instagram but because you know they've 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 got education apps that update constantly what their grade is and they got to turn this stuff in so they're very much tethered to their phones because they're students um and then also i mean you know uh, just going off of social media might make you feel a little bit better, um, but it's still the the structure of the main problems with big tech are still kind of there. You've still got people who like content moderators who are, you know, working these these gigs that don't pay very well to to go through the refuse that's posted online and seeing all this crazy stuff that they're tasked with monitoring. It's a horrible gig and one that's been written about. Um, you've got, you know, all these problems with tech that have to do with the environment, like how much water it takes to cool these data farms and everything. So yes, it's fine and good that I'm off, but like the problems are kind of still there. And you're right. It's it's a very privileged position to be able to switch off, but it feels like what's at stake is our ability to look objectively at these platforms. You know, when you're in it, when you're consuming it, when you're in many ways enjoying it, whether that's just the dopamine dopamine hit that you're getting constantly, or it's the fact that, you know, it just, it's another Star Wars thing and that's a wonderful form of escapism. It's very hard to turn 
away from it. And then uh, even in my own life, I had to literally be be uh, dragged kicking and screaming away from it. And I uh, by doing a vipassana meditation retreat, and I signed up for this thing, and and God knows why. And mm-hmm. about two a couple of days before, I realized I had to do it. And my first thought was, oh, there's so many emails that I still have to reply to. I, I don't have time to take ten days out. But reluctantly, I got on the train and went out to do the vipassana meditation. And and basically, for anybody who doesn't know, vipassana is is ten days of silent meditation. And, and, and the first part of that is locking away your devices, locking away your phones, locking away your electronics. And the anxiety I felt for the first couple of days of, oh, I didn't inform so-and-so I was going away. I didn't inform, um, uh, I didn't put an out of office email on. And there's probably people emailing me wanting things and, 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 and I probably should have deactivated my social media because people are going to be worried that I've, I've disappeared um, and, and, and they can never reach me again. Um, the reality was, of course, when I came back from the 10 days, no one cared. <laughs> like, there wasn't that that trauma. There wasn't that anxiety. But the second thing I found during that process, and again, it's it, you know, I was in a very privileged position to be able to even take 10 days out for myself to perform silent meditation. But one thing I realized was by putting the phone away, I was finally able to have a train of thought. Mm. And that sounds odd, but every lunchtime you would go on these breaks. And during these breaks, about an hour long after lunch, you could walk around this small piece of grassland and there's no thing to do. Yeah. In a weird Mm. sort of way, it sounds odd to say there's no thing to do, but all you Mm. do is you walk. And as you're walking, you're thinking, you know, the crazy thing about silent meditation is silence is deafening, you know, and all these thoughts rush to the head. And what you can't do is stop the thoughts from rushing to your head by turning to your phone. You can't turn mm-hmm. to your shiny glowing rectangle, that little bit of more parasite, that little comfort blanket and, and check notifications or go tweet something or go watch a YouTube video. You're stuck with the thoughts that are rushing in. And the only way to deal with the thoughts that are rushing in is to, to quite literally deal with them, you know, mm-hmm. to think them through. You can't write anything down during this process either. So you have to spend time trying to work out how you're going to catalog this memory or this thought that's come to your mind and you begin to work stuff out simply because there's no interruption. Mm. And it was so shocking and frightening to me that this process felt new to me. Mm. Yeah, Of course, there was mm. a time before the phones. And I wonder if that's the thing that we find so appealing, the ability to have a train of thought. You know, you and I uh, were around 30 years old each There was a time where, you know, before the Nokia 3310, there was a time where we didn't have these devices. We were able to grok and play in reality, create our own little fictions, but with our friends and in a community. And I always want to be careful to say that, you know, that time was better because certainly without the phone, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. I wouldn't be able to have a job. I wouldn't be able to pay my rent without these digital devices and and the ability to do this podcast. But equally... It does feel like, and again, as Douglas Copeland say, it does feel like I really miss my pre-internet brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I feel that. I mean, I think I think a lot of people who, uh, you know, lived that divide, like what you might call like digital migrants, but even even some some natives like um, who can just imagine what it must have been like pre-smartphone era, um, and you know. To some extent, each like context in which there's like a dominant technological thing like the TV or whatever, there's still there's always this. Oh, I remember, you know, back I missed the brain, my pre TV brain or whatever, yeah. my pre, you know, and, and that's normal. It doesn't mean that that's not to say that all the media change is the same. It's not it's not true. Um, but uh, I definitely feel that. Mm. And I think that, you know, I think it's important to to have some distance from devices that you're tethered to all the time. And I think it's normal to yearn for some time away from them. Um, I think that my issue with it is when it gets prescribed as like a, like a, like that's the solution for everybody. Like yeah. that's just what we got to do. Right. And it, it puts the burden of behavior change then on, on all of us when it's like, I can't help that, you know, like you said, like I can't help that I had that anxiety and whatever, because I mean, that's your job. That's mm. how you grow the podcast and, and whatnot. It's it's unfortunate, but it, it's 
It's true. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in support of people, you know, having a healthy relationship with their devices, even if that means occasionally kind of getting off and trying to get their head straight to have another train of thought, you know, a unique train of thought, as you say. Um, but, uh, the idea that that's the way that you solve the attention economy or something, mm. it's just, it's, it's just not true. And unfortunately, um, it's a really popular solution thanks to the social dilemma, um, where they essentially like argue for that, you know, and they say, you know, if we all put our phones down, it's akin to pressing a button, having the whole thing disappear, the whole big tech disappear. And we just know that that's just like not true at all. Well, the thing that scares me, Grafton, and, and following you on, on Twitter and having some interactions with you through there, I know it scares you too, is the fact that it's it's big tech that's offering solutions to the problems that big tech created in the first place. And that's that's best captured by the idea of the wellness industry. You know, the wellness industry is a billion dollar market suddenly created from a problem that big tech um, uh, created in the first place. You know, the wellness industry is the thing that's going to give us back our, our mind and our memories. And we get these meditation apps and calm and headspace and mm. headspace did this, this painful Netflix, uh, documentary, this painful Netflix series. But again, it's all about using digital technology to, to, sort of get us to the place before digital technology. It's like they have mm. to be there regardless. You know, mm. the wellness industry is selling us the wellness we would have had if it wasn't for those buggers in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was my, that, that's sort of what, that was my initial problem with the social dilemma guys, which their, their thing is called the center for humane tech. It used to be called mm. time well spent. Now that's like, they're like the social dilemma guys, but whatever that same group of people <laughs> That's my, that's my initial problem with them is that, you know, I just, from a, from a, I don't know, like an ethical standpoint or something, I didn't want to take their solutions because they were the ones who kind of like helped create the problem, if you will. Um, but then of course the solutions themselves are tech solutions to tech problems and even though that it's not it's not completely made explicit in the social dilemma, if you dig around a little bit on their website, the Center for Humane Tech, and read some of the stuff that those guys have written about what like how the utopias that they can consider, the ones that they dream up, like this is the perfect world we want to live in. If you and I think what's his name, Justin Rosenstein, I think he wrote this kind of treatment of like what the future would look like you know, yeah. post big tech or whatever. And it is like a digital utopia. There's no indication uh, that it would be any different than the attention economy that we're in right now. There's no, there's nothing about like the environmental costs of living in such a digital utopia or who's going to moderate it and blah, blah, blah. And how do you, who's going to make these things and devices? They don't, they, they're, they, they are, there is a supply chain here. They don't just show up out of the sky. They're, they're made in, under exploitative means. And, um, and so, and so that that's the that's a major issue. And you know what? They see tech solutions to tech problems because it's it's their narrow, very mm. STEM tech focused worldview that they have, and and it's like everything is through that lens. Well, but in that case, and I mean, it's the, it, it's the core sadness, I guess, in the book is if we spend all our time focused on uh, nostalgia, if we spend all our time living in the past, it becomes increasingly difficult to embrace and to think about the future. You know, if all of our narratives and all the narratives that we really care about exist at a time before the present, then it really problematizes how we choose to think about the future and and when folk do think about the future, they can often be dismissed as naive uh, utopians. You know, this mm. idea that tomorrow is going to be so much better than today. Again, this kind of American '60s version of the future. But as you so beautifully say, the only way to create a livable future is by creating the circumstances in the present that can breathe those futures. So what is it that we do right now for us to not just have a relationship with the past, but to have an honest and authentic and creative relationship with the future? I think it starts, you know, 
like I said, with not necessarily suppressing nostalgia or trying to excise it out of the situation, I, th- I think that also is a very privileged thing to say, to tell someone to mm-hmm. not feel nostalgic. I mean, like, imagine telling that, I mean, everything we've gone through in the past year, you know, and to be like, oh, just suck it up and deal with the pandemic, deal with your feelings. No, that's, you know, because you're right, that starts to kind of veer into this sort of techno-utopianism mm-hmm. and that the the future is always better. I mean, like we can we we can have hope for the future. Um, it does require work in the present, and to be able to do that, we do have to rely on the past. And it's not necessarily something we could write off, you know, forever. Um, I mean, I think that in terms of you know directing nostalgia, being able to have a more radical kind of nostalgia that looks back to you know and does it you know I guess yearns for. Uh, parts of the past in which there was collective action against, you know, capitalism or what have you, this, the march of state and corporate powers against regular people, um, I think is an important use of the emotion. And, you know, if there are times when nostalgia isn't an appropriate emotion to use and it's not an appropriate emotion to use, you know, it's the same thing with anger. Sometimes, I mean, you know, anger is very useful when we use it in the right way, like you know, the protests of 2020 or, or, you know, fighting for the rights of, of regular normal people against, against, you know, the powers that be, if you will. Um, other times anger is not, not very useful at all. Um, same thing with nostalgia that that's, that's part of it, you know, um, in terms of a wider tech critique, uh, I think it's important that the conversation about tech has to go beyond the the micro level, which is, you know, the individual psychological effects of big tech. I think they're important, but it's got to go beyond that. It can't even go to like the the middle level, the meso level, like, you know, politics and things like this, you know, and um, it's, it's got to go all the way to the top. You've got to be able to have conversations in the mainstream about how big tech is capitalism and that it doesn't exist separate from it. It's not a solution to capitalism. It's not an aberration. It's just capitalism doing its thing. It's, um, I think we're going to be looking at two, we're going to be faced with two, um, very dominant discourses about big tech and trying to solve the problems of big tech. I think in the next decade, on the one hand, you're going to have the social dilemma guys who mm. are going to advocate for their version of an attention economy that's going to be like, it's not Mark Zuckerberg. He's the bad guy. Trust me and trust my attention economy. It's going to let, it's going to do the, it's going to be tech doing the work for you as opposed to tech being against you. Um, we know that there are problems with that. And then I think the other tech critique you're going to see over the next 10 years, um, is what I call I call like the right wing tech critique, um, which you're already starting to see um, in the wake of Trump being deplatformed, uh, which is um, conservatives uh, saying that big tech uh, squashes free speech and that uh, it's this evil dominant thing that that is um, going to take away our rights to be able to say what we want to say um, and. We have to come up with uh, other discourses. Not pl- plenty of people are doing the work on this, you know. Um, but uh, they're, they're, those other two are very dominant. Why? Because then you, you could critique big tech without having to critique things like capitalism and the exploitation of, of capitalist labor, uh, which could be kind of difficult. And uh, doing so might call out some of these people and their interests that they have that if they were to be too critical of capitalism, they might be out of a job. Well, I guess what I'm trying to get at Grafton is, is there a, is there an equivalent emotion to nostalgia that doesn't focus on the past, but focuses on the future, an emotion that we can leverage right now in the present that will allow us to move towards the sorts of positive solutions that you're suggesting? I think, yeah, I think it's hope. I know, I mean, you know, I know Chris Hedges has written about hope. He said, hope is different than optimism. Optimism is sort of what you get sold by corporate powers to, uh, to just like pull up your bootstraps and just kind of like go along with it. Um, but I think a radical kind of hope is, um, extremely important to have and is one, um, in which there is some reliance on the past, you know, because there's no way to hope and then therefore fight for a better future. If you don't have any kind of grasp on how the previous social and collective movements of history helped to sort of time and again fight off major capitalist 
problems. This is something I think Naomi Klein has also written about brilliantly. She did. Um, she wrote, you know, this changes everything about about climate catastrophe just a few years back. And she writes about, you know, it's going to seem like that climate warming is so bad, there's nothing we can do and that we just have to sort of hate ourselves for being humans and destroying the world and basically just hold on, it's going to be a bumpy ride. But she says it's just not it's it's not a good thing to do. Instead, you have to sort of look back to the past and see how other people did it when they were fighting off these major problems of modernity um, and exploitative capitalism and then sort of fight for the future with the hope that even if you do it for a lifetime, it's like that's what you have to do. Well, Grefton, Tanner, our conversation has made me feel just a little bit more hopeful. And I just want to thank you for being on the Futures Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. 